Jeannie. Who's our guest? Jeannie. Oh, Jeannie's sick. Our guest today is Anna Summer, principal at Energy Futures Group. Hi, Anna. Hi. What are you going to talk about today? Um, I thought I'd talk about integrated resource plans. It's a topic that I work on every day and is really key to the electric industry. And it might be helpful to dispel some myths about what integrated resource plans do and do not do. Let's jump right in. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what's contained in an integrated resource plan and what it can tell you about how to plan your electric power system. And for those who aren't familiar, an IRP, and I'll probably use that acronym going forward because it's much easier to say than integrated resource plan, is a, a techno-economic analysis of an electric utilities power system that is intended to develop a plan to acquire resources that are least cost and least risk. And that sounds amazing, right? That sounds really comprehensive. Um, we can answer all the questions about risk to an electric power system and how to solve it. And the reality is that, um, like all things in life, IRPs are imperfect and there are things that they can and cannot tell us. And so I created this visualization to kind of get at that. I have this very simplified schematic of an electric power system where you have a city in the center that's being served by all of the power plants around the city. And all of the power from the wind plant, the solar plant, nuclear plant, the battery storage at the bottom are being you know, transmitted and sent across these power lines, which I've simplified to just transmission lines in this context. And a lot of folks think that this is what an IRP does, that it's essentially simulating all of these different components. And the reality of IRPs is that they don't do that. Instead, they simplify the problem down into an analysis of power plants and demand or load, essentially how much electricity consumers are, are using you know, at their homes or their places of work, et cetera. That's surprising to a lot of people. And I think that instantly raises questions about, you know, what about the power lines? How do we think about how that power is transmitted to customers, whether we need to, you know, adjust infrastructure on the distribution of the transmission system, et cetera. And the reality is that IRPs very rarely can give us information about how to do that. And so there's a big deficit of information about how we transmit electricity that we can't answer through IRPs and we have to find other mechanisms to do that. Mm -hmm. And this is a ongoing urgent issue of much interest to many people in the electric industry, <laughs> as I'm sure that you know, Bruce. So typically a utility system is doing an IRP for their service territory and they're not really modeling the complicated transmission network as a, as a web of interconnected lines. They're basically modeling their power plant, their resources and their loads, all as if they're in the same point or you know, in one area that's perfectly interconnected. So you don't have to worry about the transmission constraints and losses. And maybe they're gonna model some purchases from outside the system, or they're gonna buy a remote resource. And then they might have a transmission constraint on that import, but really mostly they're super oversimplifying the representation of the complicated grid. Yes, that's a great explanation of the problem I'm trying to articulate. Yes. <laughs> Where are we going next? How to fix that or how to, or more on the limitations? We could potentially talk about that. I don't think that there are any good answers to that. Some people use what you might call a representative circuit to try and illustrate how the need to upgrade power lines might change depending on the types of resources that you have on your system. But you know, there are typically thousands of miles of distribution and transmission lines in any given utility system, if not tens of thousands. And so what does a representative circuit actually mean in that context? <laughs> um, I, I think uh, the main message I'd like to send home is that, you know, we need to be really cognizant and self-aware about what these models can and cannot tell us. There's a lot of faith that's being put into modeling and not a lot of interest oftentimes in understanding what the limitations are, being frank about the limitations of modeling. And that's probably one of the first steps that we can take as an industry to solve these problems is to be frank with ourselves about that. Because I think the way in which you solve this problem probably looks different for different utilities. It may be that finding some way to marry the modeling of the distribution and transmission system in other modeling applications with IRP models might be the solution. It may be that doing representative analysis of you know, typical circuits might help you solve the problem for some utilities. And maybe that you need to just 
think really boldly about how do we align both distribution and IRP modeling and resource acquisition with a vision for where we want this system to go. And the answers to all those questions are probably different based on the circumstances of the utility and not something that we can generalize around for the moment. Sometimes we're tempted to uh, just want to do like an IRP for a circuit. Each circuit needs its own detailed IRP with distributed resources and more granular loads and all that detail. But we, we barely do IRP properly on a uh, utility service territory level or a system level. So, you know, doing a hundred or, you know, 500 individual IRPs would be really, um, it would get out of hand pretty quick. Yeah, that is a major limitation. I mean, even, even if you're talking about the possibility of adding interchange limits, between power plants and load, for example, there's some ability to do that given the this new crop of IRP models that are coming out, but they increase the problem size significantly and they can really impact run times. So there's a, you know, both a technological and an information gap that we need to not necessarily overcome, but find ways to work around so that we can be better informed about how all the different components of the electric system work together. So maybe like one of the kind of traditional IRP models could be used kind of at a big picture level, understanding it's approximate and kind of paint a big picture for the next 20 or, or more years of different resource plans, but then somehow drill down into more of the details of how are uh, distributed resources, you know, rooftop solar getting added. What about all these electric vehicles that are going to be charging and, and uh, maybe generating to the grid? And all that, all that kind of very fine detail, somehow it has to be kind of approximated and put into the bigger models, but then studied in its own right. Right. Yeah. No, I think we get really wrapped up in kind of what is optimal and what the optimization algorithm that we're looking at tells us. And I think for a lot of jurisdictions, particularly those with decarbonization goals, it might make more sense to say, what is the future that we're trying to achieve? What does that look like? And what does that mean that we need to enable on both the distribution, transmission, and generation sides of the system? That might tell us, you know, if we need to upgrade distribution lines, for example, transformers to accommodate additional electric vehicles, then we can think about what those upgrades look like in order to meet our goals, not necessarily what those upgrades might look like five years from now based on what's really unknowable information about how many electric vehicles we'll have in a particular area or neighborhood. They might cluster in problematic ways. Yeah, and there's no way to know that. There's no way to know that that will happen on, you know, Park Street, but not on Elm Street, for example. So if we think more about where we want to be and what that will look like, I think that might kind of reduce some of the anxiety and uncertainty around what does the optimal plan for the next five years, for example, look like? One of the things I, I feel like we, we've noticed looking at IRPs over the last decade, like four decades, is, is that um, there's a lot of um, attention to kind of fine tuning and optimization and, and so on. And then, and then it turns out like there are these just big picture things that are like crap. Like, let's say there's a target of an 80% CO2 reduction, right? And, and the utilities will just do something like, we can only get to 40 and then the model breaks, so sorry. Or the economic thing is to retire an existing coal plant, and it's just clearly economic, and the utility is just, no, you can't make us do that. And, you know, they don't quite say it in that way, but in effect, the IRP is this process of running detailed, complicated optimization models that then sort of get abused and ignored and misused. Um, yeah, or just overly emphasized. I think what you can accomplish in an IRP model, really any optimization model, is very much a product of the the uncertainties and the concerns that you want that model to represent. In fact, that is the product, that's the input into it, right? I think as humans, we have a really hard time processing a lot of different data points. We need things to be synthesized into sort of a top line conclusion. And so we spend a lot of time kind of thinking about what scenarios or sensitivities or inputs we ought to model given what we know now and not necessarily about whether the information that we're getting out of that model makes sense and whether it's actionable and whether it aligns with, you know, broader goals that we have. It's sort of like if the model says to do or don't do something, then that's what we're going to do. <laughs> that result is very much a product of the narrowness of the inputs that are offered to the model. Over the years, we've seen uh, optimization model runs where, you know, a big utility system will say, oh, we can only add, you know, 10 megawatts of wind per year. That's just the most we can do. And so then they run the model and that's a constraint on the model. And then the result is they add 10 megawatts of wind every year for the next you know, 20 years. And, and, and that amounts to a pitifully low and terribly uneconomical resource plan um, mm -hmm. to have so little wind. But you know, it was, it was an input to the model and um, 
And clearly the model is telling us what to do, right? So that, I mean, or, or here, here's our model run that shows us that our brand new coal plant investment with carbon capture and sequestration is part of the optimal plan, right? And it doesn't matter if the model had to be like tortured and beat into submission to give that result with, you know, fake cost estimates and bias projections of, you know, fuel prices and carbon, you know, it, it, it's like, oh no, that's what we have to do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think part of the reason that that arises is because these tools are very much black boxes. It takes a lot of time and energy to gain the level of understanding that you need to deeply evaluate what was done in these models. And so it also facilitates you know, hiding information if that's your intention.